Welcome. It's just the standard deviation is given by a very ghastly, scary looking formula. And most people just assume this is something that statisticians do and just accept it and blindly go on without any hint of understanding where that formula comes from. What I'd like to do in this video is give the human story behind that formula and explain what really happened in, in its evolution. It's not that difficult. Here goes. Um, we got to start with data. Suppose I have a data set, something like a 3, 5, 6, 6. Uh, most people say, look, I need a sense of what's the most typical value of a data. So they tend to look at the average, which is called mu. They use the Greek letter mu for average. So just add up the numbers 3 plus 5 plus 6 plus 6. Uh, I believe that's 20. Some of the numbers divided by how many there are. This has an average value of 5. So in some sense, 5 is the typical middle value of this data. Um, that's not enough information to really sort of get a sense of what's going on with the data. Because if I gave you the set negative 20 uh, to 731 and work out its average, I've just arranged things. So that, well, let's see, negative 20 plus 2 is negative 18, plus 31 plus 7, I believe that adds up to 20 again. I think it's 40 minus 20. Yep, that's 20 divided by four values. That also has an average value of 5. So in some sense, 5 is the middle value of that data. But this data is way more spread out in some sense than this data. That saying that 5 is a typical value of the first data set has some sort of meaning to it because they're all clustered around the number 5. We're saying 5 is the typical value of the second data set has less meaning. There's, those numbers are way spread out. So we need some sense of spread, some sense of deviation from the mean. So here goes. Let's just do the obvious human thing. What we'll do is say, OK, look at my first data set and ask how far is each particular data value from the average. Well, the data value 3 is 2 units away. The data value 5 is right on the nose, it's 0 distance away. 6 is 1 unit away. 6 is 1 unit away. So that's the deviations of each individual data piece. And what's the average deviation? It seems the obvious thing to do to measure spread. The average deviation would be just add up all the individual deviations and divide how many you've got. Divide by 4. Uh, that's 4 by f divided by 4 is 1. So in some sense, the average deviation from that mean is 1. If I do the same calculation for the second data set, the average deviation is how far is each individual data value from its mean. Well, negative 20 is 25 units away, and 2 is 3 units away, and 7 is 2 units away, and 31 is 26 units away, and that has an average for four of these deviations of, um, oh gosh, what am I doing? Uh, so 58, something like that. Oh yes, uh, 56 divided by 4, divided by 4 is 28, is 14. So the average spread, in some sense, for the second data set is 14. That tells me this, this sense of measure of deviation is grand. Uh, it tells me that the first data set is tightly clustered, second data set is spread out. I've got a, an intuitive feel, some, some sort of quantification to my intuitive feel that the second data is more spread out. And so what have I done here? What's the actual formula? Well, the average deviation is going to be, take your data set values, so maybe the first one they'll call it x1, in this case is 3, and work out how far it is from the mean. But I noticed I only cared about how far away it is, I didn't care it was to the left or to the right. So we use absolute values to make each deviation a positive quantity. Take the second data value, work out how far it is from the mean, and so on, and then divide by how many of these guys you've got. So there's a formula for the average deviation. And anyone in their right mind would say, that's it, we don't need to do anything more than that. From now on, for all statistical purposes, we should use that as a measure of spread. And that will be fine, and that's good. But people don't do that. And I'll tell you why people don't do that. It's because it's hard. Absolute values are obnoxious. They're totally miserable to work with. You know, as an example, if I asked you to, say, solve this equation, the absolute value of x is 7, you could do it without too much complaining. You say x is either 7 or it's negative version, negative 7. But if I gave you an equation like this, absolute value of x minus absolute value of x minus 2 uh, plus 5, absolute value of that, minus the absolute value of x minus 2, absolute value of that is meant to equal, oops, the absolute value of x minus 2, and ask you to solve that, you'd have just a, a, a nightmare of a time. So mathematically, absolute values are horrible to work with. So mathematicians, being sensible people, said, let's avoid them. I know it seems the natural thing to do when we talk about spread, but the mathematics of actually playing with these equations is horrendous. Uh, so we need to somehow, though, get a sense of how far data values are from the mean, and we're only using that positive dif distance, so we've got to do something of this ilk without doing absolute values. Well, the next easy thing to make numbers positive is to square them. So let's define then, well, I can't call it the average deviation now, but I will right now, but I will for the moment, to be the numbers, instead of being the absolute values, let's just square the quantities. 
and do the same thing and take that average. And that makes perfect sense. Except the trouble with this now is, if I'm a scientist, I usually care about the units attached with my data. For example, maybe my data is all lengths and all these data values are inches. So I'm to about, you know, three inches minus five inches. So I'm good difference of two inches here, but I've squared it. So this is now in the units of inches squared. Okay, so I'm just being very human. How do I fix the problem that this, this measure of deviation is in inches squared? I'd rather be in inches like the original data. Well, to do the obvious thing. This is nothing deep, just take the square root of that. And let's define that to be a measure of spread. And people call that sigma, the standard deviation. All right, that's all it is. That's all that's going on. Because you do the obvious thing with absolute values, but because absolute values are horrible to work with, you avoid them. Just mimic the same thing with the next easiest thing to doing absolute values. Then you find your units are slightly off, so take a square root to fix up the units again. This is a very natural thing to do, very easy. And if my data was right on the nose, suppose I had uh, five da four data values that were five, 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 and five. If anything was perfect in the ideal world, the average value here is five. There's actually zero spread. There's no spread whatsoever, no deviation. In fact, this formula does it for me. I get five minus five squared is zero squared, plus zero squared, plus zero squared, plus zero squared. Top line is zero, divide by four, zero divided by four is zero, square root of zero is zero. Yep, that tells me there's zero spread. So it really is doing the right thing. It's me giving me some measure of spread. Now, at this point, you might be complaining at me if you have some knowledge statistics. And you will find that some books don't do what I've done. They change something. Whoops, I need to get my pen back. They change this denominator. Rather than working with n, they choose to divide by n minus 1. And that is very mysterious and very confusing. What's even more mysterious and more confusing, if you go to different textbooks with different authors, you might find they actually divide by n rather than n minus 1, stick with the n. So it changes from book to book, just to add to the confusion. I'm going to explain what's going on here. Um, when you're doing a large number of data sets, like 10,000 data values, dividing by 9,999 versus 10,000 is not going to affect the, the calculations too much. But that's not very good when you're a high school student and you're doing examples on a test with four or five data values. Dividing by five is very different from dividing by four. So we need to sort this out. So my first answer is go with whichever book you, formula your textbook goes with. But here's, the, here's where this, this quabble comes from. Suppose I told you that a set of five data values has mean five. And I told you one data value is four, one data value is two, one data value is seven, but I'm not going to tell you what the last data value is. It's x. Do you need to know it? Or could you work it out? Well, the answer is yes, you could work it out. I've told you the average is 5, so you have to go 2 plus 3 plus 7 plus x, all divided by 4 is 5. And there comes a formula, and all you need to know, do is do some quick algebra and work out what x is. So philosophically, when I'm dealing with a set of data values, I don't need all n of them. Just one less would be enough, because I've got one less of them, I can use the, the mean value and work out what the fourth one has to be. So philosophically, when I do a formula involving n data values, there's only really n minus 1 pieces of actual information. Statisticians call this degrees of freedom. There's really only n minus 1 degrees of freedom. So to reflect that, a lot of statisticians will say, look, we're really dividing by n minus 1 pieces of actual information. Let's divide by n minus 1 instead. Um, this all rests on the idea that you know what mu is to begin with. If you don't know what mu is to begin with, then you couldn't do this trick to work out what the fourth data value is because you don't know what to put on the right-hand side, in which case you philosophically want to be finding by n. So it all depends on the context of what the person's doing with this formula in their work. In this case, that if you don't know what the mu is beforehand, you'd, you'd want to have a form that divides by n. If you're sort of assuming that in somehow your analysis you do know what mu is, at least philosophically, you want to divide by by n minus 1. But textbooks don't get into that, therefore they just sort of do this mishmishy, hand-wavy argument why explained by n minus 1, or some authors don't just divide by n, and it gets very confusing. That's the truth behind the scenes. Of course, I talk about in detail in volume 8 of these uh, Thinking Mathematics books that are available on that website. Just do a little promotion there. All right, thanks very much.